Hey everyone, Simon here from Top Tennis Training and in this video we're going to take a look at the importance of reaching a good power position for every single stroke. Now every ball that you face, unless you're facing a ball that has almost zero pace on it, a dead ball, is going to have some sort of force on it. That could be spin, that could be power, or it could be a combination of both. Now, it's important for us to have solid technique, a good foundation in our technique, so that we can handle those type of balls and actually hit them with some real authority. If we don't have solid technique, those fast balls will cause us a lot of damage and make us to hit a lot of unforced errors or forced errors. So it's important that we have a solid foundation in every single stroke so that we can handle pace, so that we can produce power, and so that we can also produce the spin and the control that we want on those shots. Now if we don't have a solid foundation and we don't reach a good power position, it will be very hard for our body to actually produce good racket speed, good leverage and good force over that oncoming ball. And of course, the more we improve, the better players we're going to be facing. So the more pace, more power is going to be coming on that ball. So it's important that we develop these habits at a very early stage of our development so that it sticks with us throughout our tennis journey. Now by reaching these good power positions, it's giving us leverage over that ball. So that ball is coming with force and we need some sort of force to counter that force so that we can hit a good shot, a good quality stroke. 13. 14. 15. Now, by producing that leverage in the rack ahead, in the wrist, in the arm, and the body, we're giving our body the maximum uh, chance to produce a good shot. It doesn't guarantee 100% that we will hit a good shot, but it's giving our body the best chance to produce a good shot. So let's take a look at the forehand power position first. So if we study the top ATP pros, we'll notice that they have common traits on their forehand. This could be the unit turn, this could be using the legs, this could be the coil and uncoil, but also most of them reach a position where the rack ahead is higher than the grip level. So we're gonna put the rack ahead in that position now where the grip is much lower than the rack ahead. Now this is creating that leverage. This is that leverage in that power position. Now once I put my left hand across my body, this is almost like the ideal power position. There will be differences. Some players will have the racket slightly lower. Some will have the, the racket head higher and a bigger swing path. But if you look at the common traits, most of the ATP pros will reach a position similar to this. The players with the best forehands in the world, we notice players like Federer and Nadal, they really exaggerate that rack ahead being higher than the grip, uh, grip level when they're preparing for the stroke. So of course, this is helping them to produce that power later on in the swing, but also it's allowing them to have a longer swing path without having to swing their arm too big. So you, you can notice from here, my rack ahead is now traveling up, coming down, and then I can accelerate, but my arm isn't going too high, so I'm not losing time. I'm gaining time by having a more compact swing, whereas the rack ahead is still traveling quite a good distance to allow me to accelerate. So that power position once again on the forehand. Rack ahead is higher than the grip level, which is creating that force, that leverage that we need later on the stroke and my left hand's across the body. So my shoulder, my left shoulder is now turned, my chin is almost touching my left shoulder. So that's the power position on the forehand. Of course, once again, there will be differences. Some players will have the racket slightly lower, some players will have it higher, but in general, you're looking for the racket head to be higher than the grip level, like so. Now let's move on to the two-handed backhand. So once again, we're looking for the racket head to be higher than the grip level, which again will give us extra space to accelerate, but that force over the ball. So if we look at the best two-handers in the world, David Albanian, Marit Safin, Andre Agassi, and now currently Novak Djokovic, 
they all reach a position similar to this. Where the tip of the racket isn't completely up, like a Sharapova would have, but it's in a medium range. So it's not level, like so, but it's not all the way up. It's somewhere in between, which allows them the space to accelerate, but they're not losing time. A lot of the WTA players, they lift the racket head like this, but then they struggle on those faster balls. And for the men, timing is everything. So for the ATP players, they hit the ball harder, so they have less time to prepare. So if they are taking the racket like this, it's gonna cause them some issues when they do face those faster balls. By reaching a position like this, it's the best of both worlds. So this is the ideal uh, power position for the two-handed backhand. Once again, the right shoulder is turned, my chin is almost touching my right shoulder, and I have my rack ahead in that position. From here, I can really accelerate fully without having to force that power or that leverage. Now, the single-handed backhand, once again, you're looking for the rack ahead to be higher than the grip level. For the single-handed backhand, is different to the two-hander because we need extra power, because we're not getting that rotational power like on the two-hander, we need extra force and extra leverage in that racket preparation, in that racket setup. So here we want the racket head to be almost completely above the grip level, just like on the forehand. So on the backhand you've got this, and if we look at Stan Wawrink and some of the best one-handers in the world, you'll notice that their racket head reaches a position similar to this. Once again, the right shoulder is turned if you're a right-handed player. Chin is almost touching the shoulder. Racket head, tip of the racket head, pointing up to the sky, and that's my power position right here. From here, I can really accelerate once again, which is the key. I want to have space to accelerate the racket without having to swing too big with the arm on its own. Now we go into the backhand slice. Once again, we want the tip of the racket higher than the grip level, so we don't want to have a racket like this on the slice. We want the racket head to be like this. Ideally, if you have time, your racket head will be above your left shoulder. 11. 12, yeah. So you'll be in that position. Arm is bent like so. And from here, once again, I have the space to accelerate without having to go too high with my arm. So the key on this slice is to have that bend in the arm, almost a 90 degree bend in that right arm. If my arm is fully extended already, before I make contact with the ball, or before I start to swing forward to contact, it's gonna be very hard for my body to accelerate because I'm using now just the shoulder. But by having this bend, I can now use the tricep muscle, the back of the upper arm, to generate that racket head speed and that power. So once again, top of the racket is higher than the grip level. As you can see, I have an L shape in my arm and my racket. And from here, I'm now able to accelerate using the tricep, but also the back muscles to squeeze together on that finish. Now we look at the volleys. Crucial when you do come to the net that you have the top of the racket higher than the grip level once again. If my, when I come to net, if my racket is like this and the ball comes high, I'll struggle to generate power on the high balls. I'll deal with the low balls fine, but I'll really struggle to generate power from here to here in that small time that I have on most of the volleys. So I want to have the racket head in that position here when I'm waiting with my split step. So I'm waiting like this, and if it comes to my forehand, my initial move will be straight away keeping the racket head in that L shape all the way through. 
So I'm keeping that L shape at the start of the stroke. If the ball is low, of course I can drop it, but I can maintain that L shape. So I don't have to actually go from here to this position where it's almost like an I shape, but it's always in that L shape. This is what's that force, that leverage for the volley. Now, a lot of players, they really struggle with this concept. They think, well, if the ball's down here, I have to drop my racket like this. Now, my wrist is a bit floppy in that position, and that's where I'll lose the power. If I'm in this position and the ball does come hard, most likely, I'm gonna lose control. So I want that L shape in the wrist and the racket head, so that if it does come low, I can still go here, and maintain that L shape. So once again, forehand volley. I'm in that ready position with the racket head higher than the grip. I take the racket to the side. I've got that L shape in my wrist and the racket head. And from here I can hit a high ball. I can hit a medium range ball. Or I can also hit a low ball with that same position. Occasionally, when the ball is really low and I don't have much time, I will have to drop the racket head and just pick it up. But that's gonna happen very rarely. So most of the time, I can maintain that L shape in the wrist. Now onto the backhand volley. Once again, I have that L shape in the wrist and the racket head. So I'm in that ready position, it comes to my backhand, I'm using the non-hitting hand to dominate the swing because I want to feel that almost this hand is catching the ball. So this hand is dominating and this hand is just following along. But I get, once again, I have that L shape in the forearm and the racket head. So from the start it's here, here, if it comes high, easy. If it comes medium, once again I maintain that L shape. And if it comes very low, I can still maintain that L shape even on a very low ball. So the volleys, it's crucial to maintain that L shape on both sides. Now we move on to the power position for the overhead smash. So once again, we're in that ready position, we're waiting for a volley or a smash, and if we do see it comes as a lob, that initial step will be to get to a position similar to a throwing position. The same as if I asked you to take a ball and to throw it, you'd reach a position similar to this. So the easiest way to find that position is just to go from the ready position, turn my left shoulder firstly, so I'm side on, and now my racket head slightly is going backwards, but not like on a serve all the way backwards. So I'm having a almost 70% service motion or 70% of that trophy pose on the serve. Now the reason we don't go all the way back like on the serve is because we're dealing with a ball that's coming quite high and a lot of times with a lot of spin, so it's gonna be dipping quite quick. If I take the racket all the way back, it's very hard for me to time it perfectly. Whereas if I keep it more onto the, the right side of my body, so in that position I'm going here, I'm keeping my left hand across the body, once again the tip of the racket is pointing up to the sky, and I'm in that position when I'm going back or forward for the smash. By maintaining that racket on the right side of my body instead of behind my head, it's gonna be easier for me to time it and hit a good smash. Once again, you're looking for the key components of a good throwing position. So without the racket, it's gonna look like this. Ready position and turning side on in that position. Right arm is bent because I want to feel that later on in the swing, I can extend the hand. So with the racket, it's gonna look like so. Ready position, I see it's coming as a lob. I get into that position right there. Maintaining that shape in the wrist. I'm not having a floppy wrist. I'm not letting it drop behind my back. I'm keeping it on this side of my body, on the right side of my body, which will allow me to time it better.
Now we look at the power position for the serve. So in general, if you study most of the biggest servers in the world, they all reach a position that is very similar. Some players use the platform stance where the feet are staying shoulder width apart. Some players like to drag their feet together into a pinpoint stance. But the upper body mechanics all look very similar. There are differences of course. Some players will have the racket slightly further away from the head. Some players will have more pronation and supination occurring during the actual trophy position, but the biomechanics of the throwing motion all look the same. So the easiest way to find the perfect power position for the serve is to put both arms out like this. Now I bend my hitting arm to about a 90 degree angle. My left hand is staying in that straight, uh, straight line. So you have a straight line from my fingers on the left hand to my right elbow, like so. Now from here, you can see that the racket head, again, higher than the grip level, isn't flopping either way. And from here now, I drop my back shoulder. So my right shoulder goes down, my left shoulder comes up. That seesaw motion. So one side goes down, and later on in the swing, this right shoulder will then come up. So once again, tip of the racket pointing up to the sky like so. Hitting arm is bent to about a 90 degree angle exactly the same as if I was going to throw a tennis ball or throw an American football. I'd reach a position similar to here and then from here I'd throw. That's the power position on the serve. Of course there will be differences. Some players, like I said, Roddick, he likes to take the racket to here. Federer, he likes to take the racket to here. And a player like Raonic has the racket more inwards this way. But the throwing mechanics are all the same. So right shoulder is below the left shoulder tip of the racket is pointing up to the sky, left arm is pointing up to the ball, the contact point, and from here I'm dropping that back shoulder. So there you have it guys, the power position for the forehand, the backhand, two-handed backhand, single-handed backhand, forehand volley, backhand volley, smash, and the serve. Hope you've enjoyed the video, if you have, give it a thumbs up, share this video with anyone who would benefit from watching it, and if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and turn on the notifications. Simon from TTT signing off. All the best guys, see you soon.